privacy is not a business problem, right? It's not necessarily the case that businesses have this pain point and they're clamoring to help protect users' privacy because it affected their bottom line. No, I mean, uh, privacy is one of these things that we value as a society, but isn't necessarily a business problem. That's kind of how I got into the world of public goods funding, because we realized that there are all sorts of things in this world that provide a net societal good, but the incentive structures that we have today aren't necessarily set up to help amplify these societal or public goods. My name is Raymond Chang. I'm the co-founder CEO of Kariba Labs, where we build tools to build sustainable public goods funding. Having come from now three worlds where I was experiencing that problem, one was science, which is highly, highly impactful, but also underfunded and has systemic um, incentive structure issues. Privacy, uh, which I've just been describing, also has these types of issues. And then also building things in open source where there's by definition no value capture mechanism. So it's difficult to do purely open source software businesses as a business problem and also uh, uh, to do purely open source software in academia, there's, there's certainly limitations. I really wanted to build things that were societal goods, things that I thought would you know, improve and amplify our humanness and our human rights, less empowering, um, you know, centralized actors. And it was around that time that I got really into building technology for human rights. So that included things like circumvention networks, peer-to-peer -peer circumvention networks to um, help people get access to the free and open internet. It included privacy preserving technologies so that um, people could communicate without the fear of being surveilled and protect their right to privacy. Um, I started publishing papers in that space and all of the things that we were doing, we were building as open source software. Recent studies have shown that upwards of 70 to 90% of a modern software stack is consists of open source software. That's code that you don't write, that's code that you get for free from your package manager. What's crazy to me is that I feel like as an industry, we're only now starting to realize that this isn't just hobby developers writing libraries um, on, the, on the weekend, but in reality, in the aggregate, this is core infrastructure. And it's not just core infrastructure for software developers, but if you actually take a look at human productivity and economic growth, you know, people are saying that software is eating the world and this is what's leading the transformation in human productivity and economic growth. Well, if software is eating the world, open source software by definition is the backbone of that transformation. We need to be thinking about open source software, not just as hobby developers working on these things. And also as infrastructure, we've started to think about it from the perspective of security vulnerabilities and software supply chain. That's important, but it also isn't just that. It, it, it is and should be economic policy because when you fund open source software, that actually leads to accelerated productivity and economic growth. We're only now in the early days of realizing what that can and should look like. There was a recent study from the EU that showed that if you just increase the number of contributions that went to open source software by 10%, you'd probably raise GDP by half a percentage point, which is pretty incredible um, if you think about the impact towards, towards the economy. Ripple effects um, into the next century. Um, you think about how the NSF was constructed in the early 20th century, that really institutionalized how we think about science and how we fund science. And that led to an incredible century of innovation in the 20th century. If you think about the types of things that um, our government has been able to fund, um, we think a lot of our modern innovations to that funding and, and those structures. Um, and yet there are a lot of things that I'm sure people now would say they wish were different about how science is done and the incentives of science, particularly in you know academic institutions that are really difficult to change. So. Um, I think we want to take a careful look at what are the incentives that we want to put in place for public goods funding um, as we start to grow that. In any kind of impact market, MRV or uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification is one of the most important things to an impact market because if you can't measure impact, then you can't sell it. One of the pitfalls that we want to be able to avoid is to have centralized parties um, dictate what constitutes you know, real impact because when you do that, it leads to uh, a concentration of power again and a potential avenue for 
um, fraud and corruption, um, which is one of the things that we are seeing in certain voluntary carbon markets. In the open source world, we want to be able to do this with transparency and in the open source ethos. So one of the tools that we're building is a tool called Open Source Observer. And with Open Source Observer, we are building uh, what we're calling the people's warehouse because we want to build it in a way that's not just open source, but also open data and open infrastructure so that anybody can come in, they can see where this data is coming from, they can see how impact is um, calculated in our data pipelines, they can contribute to that. So we do this in open source ethos and anybody can contribute to our data pipelines and anybody can access these public data sets for free. And when we create models for um, impact with different communities, all of them are forkable. So you can take a look at how it's done. If you don't like it, you can change it and tweak it in an open source fashion and be able to tailor these impact models towards your individualized communities. One of the things that we realized is that there shouldn't be a universal notion of impact because while impact should be data informed, no one community, uh, even within a community, not all participants in the community would agree on what impact looks like. And certainly between communities, they're gonna have different ideas of what impact looks like. For certain communities, it might be uh, predominantly about growth. For other communities, it might be predominantly about reliability and security. Um, for other communities, it might be about engagement and how connected the contributors are. There's all sorts of different things that different communities value. One of the things that we want to be able to do with Open Source Observer is to empower the governance of any particular community to create the impact models that works best for them um, and evolve that over time in a transparent fashion. So with Open Source Observer, one of the things that we want to be able to do is to bring business intelligence to the network. We're calling that network intelligence because at the end of the day, we want to be able to have the data to be able to show that when you make these types of funding investments into your ecosystem, that leads to this kind of layer of activity from your contributors, your developers. That leads to a certain type of ecosystem. So for example, it might lead to a certain type of software supply chain that you build with your dependency tree. And that ultimately touches this many users. So if you look at funding to developer activity to software supply chain to user analytics, that understanding that entire value chain is critical to making better and smarter investments um, at the top. So our goal is to be able to help foundations and other types of funding ecosystems to make smarter funding allocations towards their goals and impact that they care about. One of the first questions you know, that investors or other folks would ask us is, you know, what is our business model? How are we going to be sustainable? And one of the things that we had to answer for ourselves, I would argue that it wasn't actually that much of a struggle, um, was, you know, should we turn this into a traditional enterprise SaaS? Because that is a very clear way for us to va um, value capture and be able to make some revenue and be able to sustain our operations. We decided early on that that just wasn't going to be the path for us. Because if we're really trying to revolutionize open source funding, it would be, you know, antithetical to our mission to actually build everything that we're doing um, closed source just so that we could find a way to value capture. And so in order for if we really have the mission of completely transforming how we fund public goods into the future, it was important for us to build all of this out in the open and to be able to build this with the community, because I think that's ultimately the transparency is what's going to be able to help us build that trust that we need with different stakeholders and different ecosystems. And so I think we're still figuring that part out and, and how that looks like. Now, thankfully, um, we've had some pretty amazing partners in Protocol Labs and Filecoin and Optimism, um, Arbitrum and other ecosystems that have been willing to support our work with grants. Um, but we're still trying to figure out what the long-term sustainable um, play would look like. I would love to be able to see if there are ways to be able to apply the things that we're learning from impact markets in open source software towards things like science, which are also something that are a net positive to the world. You know, no matter how uh, trying or how difficult or like what types of stumbles we make, it's, it's easy to wake up in the morning and still feel incredibly excited that we're building something that we hope will have some kind of positive outcome for society. And even if we don't stick around, all of our stuff is open source and hopefully you know, that can be something that could be a starting point for, you know, the next generation that, that, that comes along.